<laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, um, thanks everyone for uh, for joining um, our June community chat. We had I had I think significant technical issues, so we are we're starting a little bit late, but uh, but I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, and uh, for everyone that could that could make it today, it is Juneteenth today, so I think a lot of people are off um, or otherwise committed. So um, that makes sense. Um, but uh, yeah, today um, I wanted to kind of chat about or talk about a blog post that Tom wrote uh, back in April called Necessary FUD. Uh, and uh, kind of two parts to this. A, I like what what you had to say, what you had laid out in the way you did. But B, I think it may be an interesting format for community chats to kind of do this once in a while, read a blog post and discuss it. And I like specifically blog posts because Typically, they're not that long. Don't take that long to read, and we get we get to promote blogging, so that's fun. Um, so um, I, I've got a couple like things and questions and stuff like that, but really, we're just going to talk about the post. Um, and uh, I guess it probably makes sense to kind of kick it off. Um, if, if Tom, if you want to kind of describe in a gist why you wrote it and 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 anything. Any insight you have there, basically. Sure, sure, sure. So I think the the inspiration behind it is unlike uh, some places I've been where we have um, not enough challenges to the central core of things. At Middlebury, sometimes it feels like we have too many things going on in too many directions. And we are just trying to show, at least to some degree, uh, what happens if you go through the system and what we're trying to give you in terms of, I guess, the value of some of the centralized IT stuff. So it's not that everything has to go this way, but if you're going outside it, like even what do you have to think about? And it also, in the end, I think made a pretty good argument to the fact that the stuff going into centralized IT and the review process, it's a pretty sophisticated thing with a lot of different skill sets and elements to consider. So that's that's kind of what drove it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense um, in terms of, I mean, my, my experience like working with, with faculty is that, um, and it's totally understandable, um, I think that people would have this impression, is that like the software acquisition process purely exists to get in people's way. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, sure, there can be like purchasing like literal dollars and cents considerations, but there's a lot more to it than that. And frankly, at least in my experience, having seen kind of both sides of it, um, it's very often not very much about dollars and cents as it is all of the things you kind of laid out in your blog post. Um, and it is a really tricky thing because obviously there needs to be a balance of well, people need what they need. People need a solution to a problem, I should say. Um, and one of the things that I um, have struggled with in, in the harder versions of these discussions I've had is getting people to think in like problems and solutions and not, I need this tool kind of right. uh, discussion. Um, and it's really hard to break people out of that in my experience. Right. Trying to get earlier in the cycle. Right. So it's like, can you come when you have the problem, not when you've come with a solution that you've decided on so that we can kind of say, hey, we have seven things already that we bought that do that. And I know most institutions probably have that the replication of tools that are very, very close. You know, we got the Chevy, the Ford, the whatever. I'm not a car guy, so I don't know why I chose that. But you know what I mean? It's all, it's all pretty close to the same thing. We're not talking about Lamborghini versus Pinto. We're talking about pretty much like this is not not extensive, crazy stuff. Middle of the road solutions don't expand all of your problems by buying duplicate stuff. That is one thing that drove this as well. Can I ask you a question, Tom? Sure. 
was it a hard post for you to write? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this is, you know, I mean, like, I think like we were reminiscing briefly uh, before the before this started, you know, about the old days, which are probably 20 years ago now, when we were essentially advocating pretty radically on that idea of individual choice by faculty to be able to pursue all these things. And so I think the line I'm trying to walk here is that no one's saying you can't or shouldn't go your own way. But if you do, particularly in this environment, which has shifted a bit, like not let people were like innocent and nice and full of love and stuff, at the, you know, 20 years ago. But it was a it was a very different orientation who was coming up with like the Web 2.0 products like you didn't have the built in. I'm going to sell all the data to whoever I'm going to use this data in an AI model. I'm going to do X, Y and Z only towards the idea being acquired um, by a large company. I don't think that was quite on the forefront of the tool creation in the way it is now. I don't think we knew as much about web accessibility at the time. Um, and I don't think we had a strategic and organized hacking community that was dedicated to like stealing people's data in the same way that we do now. It's matured. It's a very sophisticated organization now. And so like, as those things have shifted, what I would want to do, even, even my old self, I'd say like, Hey, cool. But you're going to need to at least arm yourself with these things. Cause you wouldn't want to do these things that would harm your students. Um, and if you want to take it on, absolutely cool. But it is a lot to take on. Cause one of the responses to this, which I was, you know, almost intentionally making, like, it's obvious is a lot of work. Somebody was like, can you make it simpler? And my response was like, no, that's the whole point. <laughs> I can't make it simpler. You have to do all this stuff if you're going to be forewarned, forearmed um, when, when you go to do this stuff. I'm not happy about it. I wish this was not the case, but I do feel ethically in the same way that I felt ethically at the time that you can't tell people not to use stuff. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's. Well, and, and, you know, like to make it simpler would be to make it less thorough. Right. And I, th I, I is what I am taking from that. And to me, it's, it's, it's looking at software or, or trying to accurately position software in terms of, what it is to acquire something there there's a time or or still is possibly people think of software as like because it doesn't because it's not tangible can't put your hands on it um it, it, i don't think folks value like the importance uh, as much as they do a building on campus let's say <laughs> that's uh, let's make an easy comparison right but you would never be like well, it's really hard to make this new building accessible. Can we skip that? It's like, no, we know why we want to do that, right? Like we understand the reasons for that. That's going to have a huge impact on who can use the building, obviously. Um, and but but in a lot of ways, depending on the software you're talking about, uh, obviously sometimes we're talking about a single classroom or like a course, so that you know every time it runs, it's a set of students. But it could be a lot broader than that. It could have a lot more impact in terms of number of students touching this than a building <laughs> in a lot of cases. Yeah, and the idea that buildings are either acquired or built by people with particular expertise who are knowledgeable about the legal landscape around, say, accessibility or fire escapes and stuff like that, whereas this is a much smaller sometimes or of similar or greater size engagement that is not necessarily done by experts um, in, in those fields. And just like a building, it's not like one person who knows all the stuff about the building. Um, you know, you've got a variety of different people with different skill sets who can analyze and guide that, that kind of process. And to some degree, you need similar stuff here. Well, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting parallel because like, 
every, people want to put their names on new buildings. No one wants to pay for a refurb. No one, people, nobody wants to endow the three additional cleaning people we're going to need to, to keep the building looking nice. No one wants to endow getting the gutters clean. Um, and surfacing some of those costs to the entire community is actually really important. Um, and that's where I would say, actually, you do have an answer to the, can't you make this simpler? Like, yes, it's the service catalog. It would be simpler for you to pick right. something we've already vetted. Um, yes. And we can work with you to meet that your, your needs. Like, well, right. that's, yeah, that's, not, often, just, that's often the color you want as long as it's black. It's yeah. That's often the thing here is to help um, point out the role all right of of it or a, or a technologist whatever wherever you're yeah. positioned is to say like we do have products or services that you can use and we can help you set them up in a way that may meet all of your needs or at least the most critical ones um at the very least and that's the, that's the tricky thing um people yeah, that's starting with the what what's actually important and can't you can you rank it like can yeah. you actually prioritize I know you want four things and it feels like you want them all equally. Everybody has that, but probably if you think about it, you can start to identify these are the more important and less important ones and we get part way there. So like 20 years ago, if we look at that model and that comparison, there is some interest, interesting parallels between now with all the new AI companies that are kind of popping up and you know we saw even even tried and true companies like microsoft who 20 years ago seemed dead and now is making things like total recall um the idea of like do we like would wordpress like what if like where it would be the birth of something where i felt pretty adamant 20 years ago or maybe 18 years ago 17 years ago about pushing a tool that it would not put in that catalog that they wouldn't support. And so, so much so that we got parallel hosting, you know, par built a parallel almost organization, if you will, not nearly as sophisticated. Do you see any possibility of that in this landscape? Or is that just, is that just those days are gone given the complexity of security, like you said, accessibility, et cetera? I mean, at least in 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 Middlebury, where I work now, dispositionally, I would say IT has changed to some degree, like, or maybe not changed, but I would say the disposition of of IT is more towards <clears throat> maybe over providing options and creating like so much stuff to support that it then becomes impossible. And I think this is part of the shift is that you know, let's say 20 years ago, we were begging to get any faculty to use any technology at all in many ways, right? And so one of the ways to do that would be to give them individual control and a great de degree of sophistication, um, in part because those were the people who were excited and wanted that, you know what I mean? And then here we're trying to balance, and I think honestly, Darcy Norman has talked about this some, like balancing the like 80% uh, you know, of things for 80% of the people, let's say, that's centralized and just dead simple because that's what they're looking for. And then I think you have different resources and different abilities to deal with like these people who have truly unique needs. What you don't want to do is squander the majority of your support, time, money, et cetera, on replicating common things because you never had a chance to have this unification conversation or you're letting people get away you know to some degree without prioritizing actual need and just going with the thing that they saw that caught their eye and i think that is probably a major problem at a lot of places beyond um beyond middlebury well and i, and I think too that like you know you're talking about could you have a home uh homegrown solution, but, but like where that's homegrown, I think matters, right? Like, are you doing this as a individual faculty member on your own? Fine, possibly. <laughs> and now all like, like you, like Tom, like you said before, and now these things are your concern. 
right? Your concern but, is privacy, accessibility, security, support, continuity. Um, but most of the time when we say homegrown, we're not talking about from whole cloth, like they programmed it and they host it on a server that's in their basement and, and all of this stuff, right? In the case of like a piece of software. Um, we're talking about partnering with somebody, right? It might be IT who has vetted solutions. It may be a company that you want to buy the thing, like like your post is geared towards. And like, for instance, if let let's say you were going to spin up a WordPress multi-site and no one wanted to, no one wanted to help you with it, and you went and you found a, a hosting company. Well, of course you can, hopefully, ans ask these questions of that hosting company. And if they don't have answers, then I guess it is your problem, and you may need to reconsider whether or not this is a good idea. But like, I think I don't think it makes it impossible. I think it's just, it's just you, there are more there are more things that you need to consider or owe it to your students or the community to consider. I should say, and. I don't know that that's a bad thing necessarily because I do think, I mean, it, it's it's a complicated thing, it's a time-consuming thing, but this is for the benefit of more people being able to use it safely, right? Like that's that's what we're talking about. Um, I think it's well. Yeah. I think it's interesting to put that kind of in a in a continuum with other pedagogical things, where we accept risk on behalf of students. You know, our, our scientists think about this a lot. You go into a physical sciences lab, you might get cut, you might get burned, you might get poisoned, um, an animal might bite you. Um, these, these are all real things that could happen. And we have, we've accepted two things. First of all, we're gonna make the environment, including your training as safe as possible so that those things don't happen. And yeah, we believe that there's the, the risk of them happening is outweighed by the benefit. And I, I think it's, I think one of the neat things about the posts that you wrote, Tom, is that it surfaces a whole bunch of things. The, the parallel that I see the most is with community engaged learning. And like, how are we going to get students off campus to a community site? Kenyon's a residential campus. Now we got a lot of student cars, but again, we're accepting a certain amount of risk that, that you're gonna be on the road and something, you know, you might have a car accident, you might run out of gas. So we, we work with the faculty members doing community engaged learning to start surfacing the things that they're just because of, you know, because of age and maturity, they just kind of see, but they've never really thought about managing for multiple people. And I think getting folks out of the mode of the, well, sure, I've got my hosting, I run a website, everything's fine. Um, and into these questions about um, making explicit what those things that you will accept for yourself, but now you're accepting them on behalf of your class full of students. Is, I think that's a really useful meta message in the in the post. Yeah, and in, in many ways, I see it as a bit like, you know, you go from like a super managed WordPress multi site where you don't get to use but the plugins you get them say campus press, you know, to one where there's a lot more uh, looseness there, and it comes with some complexity down to you know, a domain of one's own where we're handling some of the oversight in conjunction with a vendor and then all the way to kind of like your own server where you decided to install WordPress and you're taking on X and Y. It's always that like exchange of freedom and responsibility that comes with it with the attendant complexity. So like you know, that's that's the spectrum I see this on as well. It's like you're just navigating, deciding at each point, like, is the additional freedom or choice worth the additional risk and complexity? What this is meant to do in some ways is surface it earlier so that it's evident and apparent for you as you make those choices. So one of the things you did this year that I thought was really impressive is your work at Middlebury, you created uh, the kind of um, AI uh, experience for your community. And you made it, you know, on top of WordPress. Um, the name is blanking on me, AI. What's oh, that? Oh, de demystifying AI, is that thing? AI, right? And so like you built out this space 
And you were able to do that on a tool, open source. You had the, the possibilities. One of the one that things I wonder, you know, if we look back and paralleling with, you know, what we did in, you know, say 2017, I mean, 20, 2007, 2008, is how much of ed tech now, given the, the, the logic of the institution and the outsourcing of so much of it, has become about transactions, right? Just managing transactions, I mean, between companies. And not even like having space to build out stuff for the classroom. Like there's almost like a remove a removal because of the changing nature of what you really described beautifully at the beginning of your post, right? You have this huge 70 plus billion tech industry of ed tech that people are trying to get their hands around and you have all these people selling to all these different conferences. And so a provost, you hear that kind of, famous story. My brothers told me to do it. That's why we have this tool or they saw it at a conference. And that's why I have this tool. Like, like, where do you see the, the landscape? Are we going to go back maybe to small homegrown stuff again and be able to kind of reclaim a little bit of, of the experimentation with the space? Or is it all, especially with AI, just going to be something you couldn't even imagine hosting on campus, given the, the amount of compute you would need to do it? Like, What's what's the if you're thinking about this post when you wrote it and about the state of ed tech, um, what what's your opinion there? I know that I guess I'd yeah. more of a statement. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Well, no, I mean it's a big question, and I don't know statistically then versus now what what the state of kind of ed techy people is. You know what I mean? It would be easy for me to say like they were more adventurous, more do it yourself at the beginning. I don't know if that was the case, <laughs> you know, just proportionally. There were fewer of them. Now there's a lot more people involved in ed tech. I would say part of the challenge, though, is that solutions are sold and marketed now. And that perhaps is also why we're not getting problems. We're getting the solutions ahead and people go with solutions that they've been sold on so i think those are marketed better and more targeted and more specific these days and i think you have that in conjunction with for the most part shrinking budgets uh increased demand and one of the things that i've been arguing that's kind of indicated in this uh the fud post is that it's hard and takes a lot of time to analyze things effectively and correctly. Um, and that isn't being seen as we add things and remove positions. So, you know, it's, it's kind of that Maslowian thing. If you're not able to take care of food, water, shelter, uh, you know, at the basic level with your IT ed tech people, and they're struggling just to do that, they're not going to do the next level creative things. Um, they're not going to be looking at how do I take on an extra project? How do I do this? How do I do that? Or they won't have the time and space to develop the skills such that they could build interesting and better, more customized solutions um, in conjunction with individual faculty members, unless they're playing the martyr role, which is not good for the system either. Yeah. And it's interesting you said that because with all your posts as they, you know, go through the various angles that you got to vet before you can use a tool, like you said, that's a job in and of itself. And in many ways has become a job in and of itself at institutions because of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I look at the job board sometimes for things and it's like Penn State has like an ed tech contract manager and that is their sole job is managing those contracts with individual vendors you know and you see the specificity of that stuff at big places and i'm just like and i don't know if those exact words are right or that exact place but it was something like that you know i mean like and then you have smaller places where like that's not a job and people are just trying to make it fit in addition to other duties as assigned kind of stuff and that is part of what i've been worried about here where i'm saying like you know, if I'm reviewing LTI integrations for security in Canvas, do I have the skill set necessary to do that effectively? 
what is that skill set? You know, I don't know. Like we have some stuff we do. Is it good enough? I don't know. Like, you know, am I the one who decides if it's good enough? Do we have like, you know, I, I don't know. Those are the kind of questions that I think when you look at these deeply uh, that come up, at least for me. Pretty interesting uh, as a sidebar. So, you know, the heck fat is one of the tools, um, one of the forms you brought up, and it's basically like the higher education. Um, and then there is some meaning to the other um, <laughs> to the other parts of that acronym that I don't remember. But um, it's sponsored by Educause and it's supposed to be a tool that, uh, you know, there you go, community vendor assessment, an assessment tool. So that you deal that you have a sense that the vendor knows what they're talking about. And so we're dealing with um, another LTI that wants to integrate with the tool um, that came to us with their HECVAT to match our HECVAT. So that is something they could then go to Unison with and kind of present it as a kind of, you know, a way. And it is, it's a very different world. I remember being on a call with a college and they were like, do you have a HECVAT? And we were literally like three people as a company. And we're like, what is a heck fat? Like, what, <laughs> like, how do you do a heck fat? And, you know, it's interesting how much even we have seen this in our evolution, how much of this is about responsibility and understanding the, the, the you know, basically the shifting waters or the shifting, you know, however you would say that, the shifting landscape that is uh, defining all of these various tools, us being one of them, right? It's not like I'm outside of it at all. Um, so your post for me was really remarkable when you talked about post COVID and how much all of that just got accelerated. And I'm so interested on how the effect on ed tech groups were as a result of that. Like you bring in this, you have this colossal or this global issue, right? That affects all of us, especially, you know, remote learning. And then what comes in its wake in some ways is a, is almost a replacement of these, of these folks who supposedly bailed you out. And I can't help but think of the original Blade Runner and these replicant labor forms that have been replaced, you know, I mean, it's really, I've seen it happen at, at, at you know, group after group. It is crazy um, how little respect in that wake they've gotten. Um, but anyway, I won't go there. It, it's interesting to me to like talking about HECVAT and like vend vendors and how that applies and stuff. Like, well, first of all, like, uh, you know, we like you, you rely on the whole point of something like that, right? Is you need, if you're working with a vendor, they have to be the expert at the thing they're providing, right? Like, and that's getting to the what you were saying about like, if you're at a small place and you have someone reviewing contracts or auditing things with security, they can't audit. They can do certain levels of things, but there's a lot of trust that has to go there, right? Like if you're purchasing a product from a company, you ask them for the heck that you're, you have to, you're, you're trusting that that information is correct, obviously, right? Trust but verify. That's the whole thing. But, but sometimes we don't have the ability to verify. Um, very well right like if you it, maybe you don't have the expertise or maybe the, the thing is not open enough to um to, to audit but so that my my point there is that the thing that gets me with like security audits and i i see this both now and from when i worked at an institution is that people think of security like the idea of checking out is something secure as like a question that you can just yes or no respond to and it's like so not how that works like at all but what's frustrating to me is that you you see both companies and i i do think sometimes expert or not experts try to simplify try to get there and say like our thing is secure and it's like well what it what you know it depends greatly on what we're talking about like is is it secure because it's fine to visit a public web page and we have an ssl cert on it like in our case for a web hosting company or is what your company 
or what is what the product you're buying do shuttle students' grades around? Is it an LTI integration? Very different risk levels there, I would say. Um, and uh, the 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 I, I don't know that there's a great solution to it, but like I, I see so much of the conversation around this stuff. Try to simplify, and I feel like get so vague as to kind of eliminate the purpose of of, of the conversation. Um, and I, I don't know how to fix that personally, because I also think that we want to encourage everyone to think about risks and 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 being able to make those decisions and um that that's good i think um but um it's it's hard when you have like i've 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 worked with folks who say like oh you know you recommended this piece of software but uh it has these known vulnerabilities so we can't adopt it and i was like well did you do you know what the software does because uh, that that doesn't these vulnerabilities are not super relevant to what we're going to be using it for or whatever and i i I find that really hard as an ed tech to navigate um, because um, it is so important and it's so complicated at the same time. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. And the idea that this stuff is not a done once and you're done with it, but that it's a recurring cycle where you have to look back at it every how often, who knows, you know, like realizing, I think like the, the snowball effect of all these things is, you know, the crap that I'm trying to sort out in my head. It's like the money balloons, the support balloons, the security reviews balloon. And as an institution, if you don't have like decent systems to look at, like bringing that snowball down, like it just grows forever and your people don't and won't in most cases they're going the opposite direction so like you have to really think hard and try and bring these things up in the right conversation to say like all right if we take on this who's doing the training who's doing the technical aspect who's doing this how often is it redone like just trying to surface for people like what the real load is across the institution each time you make what to some people feels like a very limited financial transaction with a third party. That's not what this is, or it could be, but let's be explicit about that fact. We're not going to support it. We, we won't answer your help desk ticket with that thing. We'll just say best of luck. Are we willing to kind of commit to that? Cause that's what people will say and then they will do the opposite. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, yeah. Well. <laughs> Adobe. And that might be, so one thing that I think might be missing from your list of things to think about, if you don't mind, um, is how long? And I and I, I know that that question of can we actually hold that line is not, let's just say not trivial. But I think it is valuable to engage faculty members in the question of, we're not, uh, again, we're not sculpting something out of marble here. Like courses are actually, like the way that we teach courses in higher ed, they're bounded in time and they exist for a certain amount of time. And this is where a lot of the good work that Reclaim has been engaged with about how do we do web archiving is, is relevant. But some of the questions about how long do we, how long are we committing to this project to whether it's a scholarly project or a class project, can we put a timeline on it? Can we say, we'll do it for three years and then we'll evaluate. And at three years, you have to be prepared that the answer might be no, or you might, we might have to be prepared that the answer might be yes and more. Um, but I, I think trying to get people to think about, about these digital tools as, as having lifespans, as not being books that sit on the shelf and I can pull my photocopies of the syllabus from 1962 out. You know, that's not what we're talking about. And yeah, who gets to make that decision and how is it going to be made? The failure to lay that out at the beginning is probably why I haven't been more successful with this good idea. <laughs> well, and it's it's a hard thing that is people I think are justifiably scared to go into that. And like, well, now we're talking timelines, now there's an end. But the problem is you either lay out a timeline, you either agree to a timeline, or one will be forced upon you, right? Like there's no 
there's no timeline. This is in this, this will never end. Well, that doesn't exist, right? Like, so it's either you've got something written down that says, we're going to do this for five years and then reevaluate it, or someone's going to come knock your, on your door anytime between tomorrow <laughs> and when you leave and say, bad news, you know, like that, th those are the, obviously that that's an extreme, but my point is that if you don't have an agreed uh, upon uh, timeline, you don't have one. Um, it's, it's not an extreme. I don't think. Well, well I'm and, saying it, it does happen. Yeah. That's, that's a realistic, but the other end of that spectrum is what I'm saying. We had a bunch of those in the era of the network aware virus, like just as to, to, to dredge up the 20 year old history, you know, various equipment that was on the network because it was convenient and was found to be too, too dangerous to the operation of the network to keep on. In one case, I think we actually super glued a cut network cable into the network port on a computer because it had to keep doing what it was doing, but it absolutely had to not do it on our network. Well, I mean, the tricky thing too, like that, that is part of what we're trying to figure out, at least at Middlebury is like, when these things become more than a couple people, say a department or multiple departments and enterprise, like that idea of who is setting the timeline and what the decision-making process looks like is super, super hard. Because, you know, does the department chair speak for the department? Often not, <laughs> you know, like, so where is the strategic choice made as you move beyond a handful of people and even with three people two vote for termination one says no it's essential to my teaching centrally fund it who wins in that conversation unless you've laid this stuff out like you just sow the seeds for like a great deal of animosity and anger and or an ever ballooning kind of expanse of things that you're trying to support and or pay for. And I, I think that stuff has not been historically well laid out just because it's so hard to do. There's no right answer. There's just which way do you want to do it? And often it's scorched earth as a result, right? Like, oh, yeah, it's like, boom, it's going, you know, and that usually comes with leadership at the top changing. And, you know, people basically having different values or different agendas, you know, and like you said, not right or wrong, but whole swaths of, of, of part of the history of stuff that went on um, often or can get decimated, which brings us back to the archiving and having some responsible plan B at the point where these things do go away, because they will, you know, there is a, there is a shelf life. Um, to all these projects for sure. And yeah. so that's a that's why the archiving stuff is interesting, I agree, but it's also interesting um, as an ed tech, then you have to read the politics of the, of the institution and figure out which things you do or have time to preserve or to kind of see that coming. I mean, there's a lot going on there. Well, and that's that's in in that what I was going to add to that, too, is like in the case of like website hosting, archiving is one solution, right? Then the nice thing, if you do have a timeline or you're or you're sitting at that table creating a timeline, if you're part of that conversation, you can add to that of, OK, so when this ends, what do we do? Like maybe, maybe you, maybe you can't, but that's my favorite thing to be able to do because now you have a lot more, um, maybe not, maybe guarantee is too sure, sure, uh, of a word, but you have a, a better, um, game plan, I guess of, all right, well, the continuity of the service is dead. So we were doing that one day and now we can't, it's gone. If you can agree on a timeline and you can have a conversation about what do we do, you may actually be able to come up with solutions, maybe IT helps you, of migrating things to another alternative service that the that can outlive it or archiving it if that if it's that type of thing or turning the service over to individuals who want to keep using it. And what does that mean? Does, does it mean they pay for it some other way or like it's just... Uh, you know, that the, the can mean a lot of things, depending on what we're talking about, obviously. Um, but that is, it, again, like, I really understand why people get antsy when they're saying, let's do this for three years. And but but 
I always try to say like, this is the, that's what you want. Like, let's put, let's agree on a number of years. Um, otherwise this is going to, could end up ending badly. Right. And do, do you have a definition of pilot? You know, like, what does that mean? <laughs> what happens <laughs> at the end of the pilot? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing. It's like, and this is, again, I feel the same way about talking about processes and documentation that I feel about writing that post, you know, where I'm like, oh, Jesus, this is awful. I did not get into this job to do these things. But I did get into this job because I feel like people need it help with these things because they haven't done it a bunch of times or they don't have experience in this stuff. And these are the unfortunate things that make this work, you know, and it stops this horrible thing from happening. So while we will have to eat like raw beets or something once a week, we're not going to get, I don't know, gangrene. I don't know beets don't impact gangrene, but I just make stuff up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Minor, minor hassle in the scheme of things versus major problems. And, you know, it is boring stuff. Like no one wants to write processes. I don't think no one wants to do documentation. No one wants to say what a pilot is in our institution and what you should expect when you engage in one. But if you don't, you just have random crap that doesn't protect anyone but has all the overhead of the hassle. And I think that's that's what you get. Either you take control of the hassle and make it serve someone, or you suffer for it forever, always, and get no benefit. That's been a wake-up call for Reclaim, I'll be honest with you, because, you know, in 2013 when we started, security wasn't at the point it was. Like you said, they weren't organized you know, hacking organizations that are working towards, you know, bringing down major infrastructure for profit with ransomware or what have you. So we have gone through for the last year and a half, a process called TX ramp, which is essentially like, it took a year and a half for one of our employees, a huge part of their time to figure this out and to work through this and build in these processes and get us in a situation security wise where, you know, we can answer a lot of the kind of overarching questions, but like, think about that for a small company like ours or for a small team like yours, it takes a huge part of a labor force to even just kind of come to terms with those processes you're talking about. I didn't even think it's like eating a beat once a week. It's like two or three days of the week is kind of, you know, that's where you're living. And I think that balance has been hard for me to, to manage, you know, given that, you know, this is not Google, right? We're not, we're not operating at the element of AWS, you know, but yet it is required. And that has brought a whole new question that you have raised, Tom, about ballooning costs as a result of stuff like that and making it all the more hard in this landscape to kind of like remain, you know, when you're, when you're not necessarily trying to be bought and you just want to be a small company and be profitable, it becomes, it becomes a real balance. I'll be honest. Well, and it's probably worth pointing out too, that for something like TX ramp, most of that were, I, I'm not the person who did it. So I, I don't want to talk, you know, maybe at some point we'll have Noah talk more about that, but like, but like a lot of that work was simply documenting and making processes around things that we're already doing. Certainly there were some technical changes, control changes, uh, process, you know, uh, or like workflow changes, but most of it was stuff we were doing, <laughs> you know? And so, my my point is that's that's that amount of work for for stuff that we were you know uh largely already aware of and doing um not completely but um but that's that is in some ways a i wouldn't say best case scenario but a pretty good good case scenario i guess there you could see you could imagine a company that would had to do something like comply with tx ramp and had none of this stuff in place and then was just like okay well i guess we can't do this 
Um, and I mean, that's not even necessarily a bad thing, right? Like we're talking about software for schools. We're talking about software that that students don't get to pick. They have to engage with a lot of times, um, not necessarily all the time, but I don't know. Like I, I kind of fall on both sides of it. it is it's a it's a cost, but I think it's when we're talking about education, it's uh, maybe short of healthcare about the most important time to apply these things. I think and subsidize just as well. <laughs> so yeah, this will be the next reclaim conference, right? It'll be all about processes and um yeah, we're big yeah. fans, you can tell. <laughs> it, it could be though. I mean, <laughs> like I, I think that was the real honesty of that post, right? Is is like, you know, this is this is what I'm dealing with, and this is the reality of like a wake up call. I I liked it, and I know a lot of other people liked it and responded about it because, I mean, you're not alone in this, and I think you articulated what a lot of people are going through as this this kind of field changes, and we feel it, you know, on our side with the security in particular, as I'm sure you all do on campus, um, it's it's a different world, right? Like we didn't give, I mean, I remember joking with my students about their, their uh, cPanel sites being hacked by a hacker from, you know, Turkey, Imran, you know, 488. And it was, a, it kind of treated it like a joke. And God, I mean, that, that would not fly. <laughs> that would not fly today. You but know. I would argue, though, that that is it. That is in some ways conceptualizing and talking about trying to make students understand what is at risk and what can happen. Right. Like to me, that's super important is people understand when something is hacked, what happens? Is my bank account safe? Probably in that example. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like maybe you don't have a file in your cPanel account with all your passwords. Like that's maybe not a good idea. <laughs> you should use something for that, that you can trust with that thing, a password manager or whatever, a safe, I don't know, right? But like to me, that's part of, the reason I like this post is, I know like you, you have used fear, uh, you know, uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, but I would say on the other token is if you read through this list and you say, these two things are not applicable and I understand how to, to work with this thing, then in some ways you can also come to the table at a conversation being like, okay, I think my solution is good and here's why. Like you, you, you are armed with information on saying, I do think that my software I wanna purchase is responsible and for these reasons. Like this goes both directions, I think. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, and. I'll make an interesting parallel and one that doesn't make up made up things about beats and uh, <laughs> other medical conditions. Cars, uh, but yeah, cars, beats. I'm I'm just mixing Buildings. all the all the stuff. My son uh, just came back from a cross country trip kayaking, where he went crazy places and rode, you know, off 20, 25 foot waterfalls in a kayak. And he shows me this clip of one of his friends going through like this raging, insane torrent of stuff. And he's like, I didn't, I didn't um, kayak this one because I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't think my skills were a good match for it. And, and that's the thing that I hope like something this would do. So if you have some idea of the risks, and some idea at least of the categories, you're better informed to decide, are you going down this river? Are you going off this waterfall? You know, as opposed to what I think happens now with like other kids sometimes is they get out there, they're like, that's super cool. I saw the YouTube video, I'm good to go. And they just go off the waterfall, 25 feet, break their necks. You know what I mean? So there is a certain degree of fear and uncertainty and doubt that you should have in these scenarios. And how can we give it to you in a way that isn't necessarily overwhelming? Or if it feels overwhelming, perhaps that means you should not get on this particular river. Um, and that's that's kind of the method that I would hope comes out of it. You know, not straight up like doubt everything that isn't Microsoft, but you got to think about these things. And if this is overwhelming, 
perhaps this is not the path you should take. That sounds to me like a swamp of knowledge. <laughs> At least a river, a stream, something. Cool. Well, we're. I think that's. I think that was a good note to end it on because I, I feel like you summarized that. Um, or you 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 put the end at the beginning, tied that a nice bow. So, and we're a little bit over time. So, um, I think we'll stop the recording here and. Uh, See everybody next time, and thanks, everyone, for joining.